Good morning. My name is Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse and Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for joining our webinar today. ASEF is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the Educational Facilities Discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. We are excited to have a wonderful presenter, Mr. Carl Sussman, joining us today for this webinar entitled, An Overview of Early Childhood Facilities Finance. Mr. Sussman has over 40 years of experience in the fields of nonprofit and public sector management and community development finance, including 16 years delivering management and community management consulting services, and 15 years serving as the founding chief executive of a state quasi-public technical assistance and finance corporation with statewide housing, child care facilities finance, and community economic development responsibilities. During his career, Mr. Sussman has consulted over 100 organizations nationwide and served as an author and co-author to numerous publications related to child care facilities and finance. Thank you, Mr. Sussman, for sharing your expertise with our audience today. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you take this opportunity to learn from the content presented, engage with the speaker, and add to your professional knowledge of investing in early childhood facilities. I'm uh, pleased to be able to do this webinar today. Uh, I think the topic is one that's really important. It's very unfortunate that there's so few resources that are available to really create quality early learning environments for young children. And um, as I will try to explain today, I think it's very important to have uh, environments that are specifically created for young children, uh, the preschool age children, and therefore it's important to uh, develop resources and find ways to finance these kinds of projects. I'm going to be uh, giving a couple of opportunities during the course of this uh, presentation to look at questions people may have been sending in and uh, try to answer those. So if you have questions along the way, uh, I may not get to all of them, but if you uh, type in your questions on the uh, text chat, I will uh, try to get to a few so you don't feel like you're left behind if you're confused by anything. Let me start by doing a, a quick survey to find out who is there uh, listening to this webinar. So are you participating in this webinar because you're involved with a planned public school project as opposed to one that's not a public school project? So most of you are not. Roughly one-third are involved in a public school project. Okay. And let me ask a follow-up question of those of you who have been involved, uh, have you previously uh, been involved in developing a preschool space? So yes in a public school, yes in a privately owned or leased facility or no? Okay, so it sounds like of that one-third that uh, has been involved in public school, projects. A lot of you seem to have been, have done previously been involved in a project. So you've got some background and maybe you have some thoughts you can, can add to this um, webinar. So there's three routes to financial feasibility. There's three parts usually in a financing uh, package uh, that brought together makes a project feasible. Obviously one of those is, is what's the cost of the project. Um, and obviously it's the higher the cost, the more difficult it is to finance the project. And then the two sources of financing usually are a combination of equity is the word I'm going to use, but equity is basically um, uh, grant money, money that's, that's available up front, money you don't have to borrow. Uh, and then the, the other key source is, is debt. And the question there is both how accessible it is. Uh, oftentimes you can't qualify for a loan, so it's not accessible. And uh, the other question is how affordable it is. So uh, if you can get loan terms that are favorable enough to make the project um, feasible. So the simple analogy here is uh, buying a home, which most of you, if you haven't either 
uh, had that experience, you probably are at least familiar with, with that. So like home finance, we're talking about the price, we're talking about the uh, down payment, which is what is equity, the uh, savings that you're going to put into that home purchase. And then invariably you, you need to, it's a big purchase, and you're going to need to borrow money and you um, take out a mortgage loan uh, to, to pay the debt. So those are those three elements we were just talking about. And your goals, obviously, uh, to get the best house you can for the money you can afford. Uh, you want to, in your debt, minimize your monthly payments. Uh, so you want a long repayment period. Um, 15 years gets you a quicker repayment. 30 years makes the each payment a little bit smaller, so you pay for a lot more uh, over the long term. And then you're also interested in, interested in the interest rate and kept capturing the lowest rate you can get. So that helps to make it affordable. And then you obviously uh, have constraints in terms of your down payment, what you can, what your savings are. You want to make sure that you um, have enough to to, um, to to buy the house, to afford the house. So that's, in simple terms, uh, what financing an early childhood facility um, is like. So, so one of the things I'm going to be talking about throughout this is capital subsidy. It's really what we're talking about. Uh, is that one of the reasons there are so few good early childhood facilities is that there's just not enough capital available. And so what you need is some form of capital subsidy. And uh, we talk about those as being very shallow. Uh, the shallowest is uh, really covers about um, up to 5% of the capital cost, so that doesn't take a lot off the value of the property. Um, but you can then get into deeper subsidies, which may be uh, covering half or, or even um, uh, two-thirds of the cost of the property, and then very deep subsidies. So a lot of public school systems um, are able to get uh, state financing for their uh, public schools, uh, in some cases as much as 100%. So that obviously would be a very deep capital subsidy. Uh, so I'll be talking about, um, when we talk about the different financing tools, uh, the depth of the subsidy, this is what I'm uh, referring to. So let's start with cost, uh, talking about those three variables that get you to affordability. So what are the things that drive the capital costs on an early childhood project? Well, obviously, there's the uh, being economical versus the quality of the facility. Uh, higher quality, uh, whether it's the materials, the amount of space, uh, the things that usually contribute to quality in an early childhood facility cost money. So you have this uh, tension. You want to create a quality environment. At the same time, uh, you are um, obviously facing serious uh, constraints on the um, uh, side of financing. Uh, costs generally are comparable to those of, of uh, other public school buildings. Um, and uh, uh, licensing in child care, which a lot of public schools are, don't have to um, have licenses the way um, private uh, child care facilities need to have uh, licenses. State requirements generally are 35 square feet per child in the classroom. That's really an inadequate standard. It's, it's um, the, the very minimal that's, that's uh, required. So again, as you add uh, space, which uh, improves the quality, it also drives up costs, obviously. In early childhood facilities, you also have a lot of plumbing uh, that's more distributed than what you have in a public school, uh, in the typical public school. So uh, it's desirable to have a bathroom in each classroom. Uh, and that's going to obviously, did I say, <laughs> I meant a bathroom adjacent to each classroom. And that obviously will add a lot of costs. Within the classroom, it's also desirable to have sinks for both hand washing for children and also uh, at adult level um, for uh, adult uh, uses, both for preparing uh, activities that uh, use water, for cleaning up, uh, things like that. Um, and then just the fixtures and finishes and the, the level of, of uh, quality. All of those things drive costs. So one of the things that is often said about uh, early child environments is that it is the third teacher. Uh, so 
it, the point is that environment actually exerts a, a powerful influence over program quality. And a lot of it is teacher effectiveness. One very interesting um, study that uh, I became aware of was one that was done at the School for Young Children in West Hartford, Connecticut, where they um, it is a lab school uh, with, at St. Joseph's College uh, where they have an early childhood education program. So students do activities in this child care center. One of the activities they do is a research project where they categorize uh, the activities that children are doing uh, and they go around to each child uh, sequentially and every 30 seconds they record uh, what a child is doing and then they also record whether they are interacting with a teacher. Uh, and uh, what they found was that on average 3% of the observations there was interaction between a teacher and a child, which is extremely low percent. And um, that they did this each year and came up pretty much with the same findings each year. But then one year suddenly they ended up with finding that it was 21% rather than 3%, seven times more teacher interaction with the children. And so the question was, what's changed here? the same teachers, the same curriculum, and what they found was that in fact they um, uh, had moved to a different space. And the difference, the main difference in the space was that it was more, the classrooms were more generous in terms of square footage, but the most important thing was that there was a bathroom uh, adjacent to each classroom that is directly accessible from the classroom. And what they realized is that uh, when you have just two teachers in a classroom and you have one teacher that's often out of the classroom accompanying the child to the bathroom, you really are out of ratio. There's fewer, children, uh, fewer adults in the classroom and therefore there's less time to interact. When there's both teachers in the classroom, obviously there's a lot more interaction that's going on. So um, that's sort of an example of how the facility can make a big difference in terms of supporting teacher effectiveness. Um, uh, you also, uh, classrooms being big enough to have activity areas that are well defined and well separated, that also um, is a way to improve the quality of the learning experience for children. Uh, the space also um, has a lot to do with how children um, learn behaviors and self-regulation, or uh, able to manage their own behavior and, and self-regulate. So just the difference between being able to go to the bathroom without having to get a teacher, do it independently and experience that kind of independence, uh, the ability to move to different areas in the room that have different qualitative characteristics so that if you're feeling kind of overstimulated, a child can learn that they can actually move themselves physically to another uh, area of the classroom. Uh, that's all part of the learning that children do in, uh, in early childhood education. It's that kind of behavior that prepares them for school. And then language acquisition is a very important activity that goes on through birth, but is key, obviously, to academic success. And if a classroom has poor acoustics, which are often the case in, in early childhood environments, uh, it becomes much more difficult to uh, differentiate sounds and to, um, and to just learn language. So physical environment is really important for lots of reasons. Uh, so the physical space doesn't itself create quality, but it supports quality. You, it, a good space won't make a bad program good, but a good space will make a good program shine. So what makes a, um, an early childhood facility different? Um, I think one of the important things, I'm going to use a little laser tool here. Um, one of the important uh, characteristics is that you ha need to have some sort of short-term parking for drop-off. It's a little bit different than when children are even a little bit older where you can pull up in front of the school, let the child jump out of the car, uh, and, and go into the school. When you're dealing with children who are uh, preschool age, you, you, the parent generally does, in fact, accompany the child into the school. And uh, so you need some sort of safe short-term parking. You need the classrooms near the entrance to the school. So this is uh, relevant, particularly where you have an existing elementary school, for example, and you have um, space uh, because of enrollments that you can put an early childhood classroom uh, into, the, uh, into the school. Uh, you need to think about where it can be placed. Um, can you provide that kind of 
better access for parents uh, and have the classrooms near wherever the entrance is and does the entrance provide that kind of short-term parking specifically for the parents of preschool children. Uh, and then another uh, interesting characteristic is the a common area, which is a characteristic you find in a lot of well-planned early childhood facilities. And um, this is can be both a multi-function space, so you can have some programmatic activities, special events and things like that, but it often is sort of a, a more family-focused um, area. And um, at the end of this uh, PowerPoint, there's a few images I'll show you that give you an idea of what that kind of thing looks like. And then, of course, the classrooms have uh, direct access to playgrounds. And so you have toddler, infant, and preschool classrooms, and they directly access um, playgrounds. And in each case, the playgrounds, um, it, it's not sufficient to use a, a standard elementary school playground. First of all, these are very young children. They don't, uh, it's, it's difficult for them to compete with older kids. The kinds of equipment that they should be playing on uh, is different in scale. So you really need different kinds and specialized playgrounds for each age group. Uh, and then as this um, bubble diagram shows, uh, you have bathrooms um, associated with each classroom. So in general, it's, it's a, um, there's some similarities, but there also are some important differences from um, standard um, schools. So um, the other important thing to keep in mind is that preschool children are littler, which is obvious. They are physically uh, smaller. So uh, as this picture over here shows, you need to have fixtures that are um, scaled to the children. So here's a water fountain, but the same thing is true with toilet sinks and uh, handrails and, and uh, the other things that allow children to be independent. And um, they're also developmentally different. Uh, and that means that, you know, they, just as we were talking about at the beginning, where they uh, need parents to actually drop them off physically uh, in the classroom, um, they, there are developmental differences that have to be reflected in the design of the space. So a couple of the special considerations. Uh, one is scale, both at the building and classroom level, and then just proportioning things that we were just talking about to the to children's size. So this is a, uh, this um, picture here is a part of a classroom in an early childhood facility, and it kind of highlights some of the things that are um, you see in, in a well-designed space. So this is just part of the classroom, but it's a defined, it's, while it's open and easily visible from anywhere in the classroom, it's um, a very defined space. So if you, if this works here, right here is a soffit, where in other words the ceiling comes down lower uh, at that point, and at the same time you also have the, the floor up higher. So that creates a very different and more intimate um, space and it's very well defined by these uh, the furniture and the walls so you actually have three corners um, which are very protected areas and if you just have one big open space even if you just have furniture creating activity space you don't create quite as sheltered and, and enclosed a sense as you uh, do when you do it architecturally as it has been done in this case so this is a case where you take a classroom, which is a big space for a young child, and you create smaller spaces within it. It's almost like you think of it as a house with rooms. In this case, it's a classroom with activity spaces, but they have to be kind of well-defined and, and distinct. So scaling the building, the classrooms, and then the different features in the classroom, like think height to the, to the uh, children's level. In terms of ambiance, almost everything I've ever read about early childhood facilities um, talks about trying to create more of a residential ambiance as opposed to an institutional one. Um, and so the treatment of halls, lighting, things like that can have a big effect on um, how the space feels. And then uh, the sensory environment. I talked before about the importance of language acquisition. And so acoustics in these early childhood classrooms is very important. Uh, and what kind of sound absorbing materials you have uh, natural and artificial um, light. Uh, I was recently involved in a um, study of facilities in, in Massachusetts, a big survey of early childhood facilities, 
and found that there were 15% of the classrooms had no natural light, which uh, I found just remarkable to think about students spending the entire day, every day, uh, in a space without natural light. And then it's very common to find uh, lighting schemes in classrooms, as you do in public school classrooms, which are this um, laid-in fluorescent lights in an acoustic ceiling, um, which provides good lighting, but and very uniform lighting and one type of lighting, whereas in an early childhood environment, if you try to create smaller spaces within that large space, you really want to try to use different kinds of lighting, some that's uh, not as diffuse as um, the fluorescent lights uh, provide. And we talked about plumbing and bathrooms, and then classroom configuration, again, is um, uh, it's often easier to create these uh, well-defined smaller areas uh, if you have um, uh, a classroom that's not just a rectangle, that it has a little bit more complexity to it, alcoves, things like that, that allow you to, to build spaces into it. So reducing capital costs, some of the strategies and pros and cons. One is shared use, um, and uh, uh, that uh, can be difficult because um, as a lot of after-school programs in public schools, for example, they don't have their resources uh, immediately available. Classroom teachers who usually uh, occupy that space find it disruptive to uh, have other groups of children in there. On the other hand, there are ways to share space, uh, shared use. In, in Oklahoma, for example, the, the um, public preschool program there, uh, they actually send public school teachers into child care centers uh, to uh, facilities that are private facilities and where children are, and they provide the program in that space. Uh, so it's uh, a space that's provided by those programs, but the, um, you have the public school curriculum being offered to the teachers who are there, and that's a way of sharing space. Another way to reduce costs is to, to lease land, um, as opposed to having that as a part of the capital cost, the development cost of the facility or leasing a building, obviously, then you re you're doing leasehold improvements. It does restrict the extent of what you can do, but it does also reduce the initial outlay. It overcomes a lot of the burden of uh, borrowing um, that you would have to do if you were actually purchasing a piece of real estate and doing a, a larger renovation. In terms of renovation versus new construction, my experience is that um, the Intuitively, what you think is that renovation is less expensive. It's not always the case. Uh, it can often be uh, you're, you're dealing with a, uh, a, the building's bones, which may not be uh, the right bones for, for your use. And then um, you can certainly outsource uh, some of these projects to someone else using someone else's facility as opposed to uh, uh, creating your own facility. The other thing to keep in mind here as we talk about early childhood education is that it's a a, what I call a mixed delivery system. So on the one hand, you have different uh, early childhood services are provided by different kinds of organizations. So you have community-based organizations, both nonprofits and usually you know, child care programs. You have for-profit child care programs, early education programs. You have uh, religious institution-based ones. You have the public schools. And then you also have uh, some joint use facilities. You also have different revenue models to do this. It's not like the public school system where you may have different streams like special education, but it is basically a public system and all of the resources are coming uh, from one general area. With um, early childhood education, you have uh, public pre-K in those states and communities that have that. There's Head Start programs, which are sometimes run by school systems and sometimes by other organizations. Uh, parent fees obviously support uh, child care. There's public subsidies for child care. So there's different sources of income, and that also provides some opportunities to provide different forms of financing, as we'll get to in, in just a minute. One other important consideration, though, is that um, as you build early childhood classrooms in public schools, uh, they're usually designed to serve four-year-olds or three- and four-year-olds, which are preschool age, as opposed to infant and toddler, which are the younger children. What has happened is that it's um, siphoning off children who are in child care programs. Child care programs are 
uh, feasible in many cases because of preschool children, where the ratio of children to adult um, is, uh, there's more children to adults relative to infant and toddler. And therefore, they, the preschool programs tend to subsidize infant and toddler care, where the public schools are taking over uh, preschool. In many cases, it's jeopardizing uh, the availability of infant and toddler care and, and, and earlier preschool, preschool care in those communities. So uh, there really needs to be some coordination done at community level. It's not just about uh, the public school program itself. So um, we've talked about costs now and uh, seen that there are a lot of special features in an early childhood facility which drive costs up. Uh, there are some strategies for maybe bringing that um, cost down somewhat, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. But now I want to move on to the, the debt component. We're talking about large capital investment. And when you make large capital investments, these are long-term investments. It makes sense to pay for them with debt. So you're paying just a, a small portion uh, of the cost each year as you pay the interest and principal on the loan. Let me just um, ask a, a, question, a couple of questions here. Um, does your state provide a capital subsidy to your school districts? In other words, are the school districts 100% responsible for uh, raising the capital they need, or does the state also provide it, or provide some of it? It's that um, about two-thirds provide some capital subsidy, and about um, one-third do not. And uh, actually, I have some statistics here. There's 13 states plus the District of Columbia that provide 50% of the cost or more. Um, there's 11 states that provide none, and then there's you know states in between. So the the model for financing capital for public schools uh, are very different state to state. Uh, yes. One further question: uh, who, Of those of you who said yes to that first que that question, does the subsidy apply to space for public preschools as well? A lot of states um, don't allow the public financing, state public financing for preschool classrooms, uh, although some do and provide some incentive. So about three quarters of uh, or more. So a lot of the states, it seems like, uh, that do provide financing uh, don't limit it just to um, to school aid, but also um, there's a fair number that also don't provide preschool. So that's that's encouraging. Uh, I'm glad to see that. Let me go back to the PowerPoint here. So why debt? As I said before, it's a, a way you um, spread the cost of the building's useful life uh, over a longer period of time, amortizing the cost. It makes it more affordable because you don't have to generate all of the money up front and pay for it in little pieces. So just as an example, this pie chart here, if you had a $3 million building and you had a 30-year mortgage at 5%, uh, the debt service would be $195,000 per year or $1,600 per child. Well, that blue piece of the pie represents roughly 7% of that $3 million cost. That's the annual debt service. So obviously, over 30 years, you're going to end up paying more than $3 million because you're paying interest payments. But it, it does become much more affordable in terms of just the ability to manage the cost and, and turn it into an operating cost, that $1,600 per child. So um, to get to affordability, um, interest rate, term, down payment, those are the three variables you're talking about. And um, the second is, so that's affordability. The next issue is access to debt. So um, sometimes it's very difficult to uh, get someone to extend credit to you. And so a lender or investor um, does underwriting, which is basically um, trying to evaluate the risk before they make a loan. They look at the repayment risk, how dependable is the source of the repayment. So um, cities and towns which have access to a tax base, they do. That becomes less risky because it's um, there in theory at least the ability to to raise taxes to um, satisfy um, the loan payments. Um, uh, if it's a, um, a child care program, uh, it's more difficult to obviously to um, show stable repayment. Um, in some cases, like a Head Start program, where there's a little bit more consistency over time, um, there's a, a better chance to to demonstrate the ability to repay a loan. 
they also look at loan to value. They don't want the, the, the loan itself to exceed the value of the property. Uh, in fact, they want it to be the opposite. They want the value of the property to be greater than the loan at all points so that you always have an incentive to repay the loan. And then finally, there's debt coverage ratio. They look at your operating costs. And after paying the, what the debt service will be, how much cushion is there? So if uh, you go into lean years for some reason, uh, there'll be uh, some protection for the for the lender. Uh, to deal with a lot of these issues, um, there's um, credit enhancements. So you've, I'm sure, heard the expression loan guarantees, which is a way of reducing the risk to the um, lender. Uh, someone is basically guaranteeing the repayment. And there are um, lots of programs like that. Uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has a program, uh, rural development program, which does provide loan guarantees for up to 90% of the cost of the loan. Uh, it's only available with um, 20,000 people or fewer. And uh, there are a number of other conditions under which they um, will um, uh, make those loans available, loan, loan guarantees. Um, but those are uh, four community facilities, including schools and preschools. Um, another way to um, uh, make it easier for a lender to come in is to bring in some subordinated debt, and that is a, a loan that's um, like a, a home equity loan. So you have a mortgage, uh, and that's your uh, first obligation, and then there's an a equity, um, home equity loan, which would be, is really a subordinated loan, uh, and it's um, if for some reason you default and the bank forecloses on the property, uh, from the foreclosure sale, the mortgage holder, the first mortgage holder, gets repaid before a subordinate lender. So essentially, the subordinate lender is taking more risk. Um, and um, an example here is the state of Maryland has a, uh, uh, in their economic development, community and economic development department, uh, they do have a child care loan program. Uh, and one of the products they have is a subordinated debt that will subordinate a loan to uh, a first mortgage lender. So if the, uh, you need to make get, say, a million dollar loan and the bank's only willing to make a half million dollar loan because of their perception of the risk, the state might provide an additional half million dollar loan uh, and put themselves at a at greater risk of, uh, of the loan failing if, if the fact it did. Um, and then finally, um, credit enhancement has a slight interest rate advantage for the borrower because as you remove risk, um, the rate, the interest rate that a bank charges usually declines. And that's why on this uh, 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 graph showing the, the depth of the subsidy, there is this, not only allows you to get access to debt, but it also provides a small capital subsidy in the form of a, an interest rate subsidy. So just this is graph was just trying to show that the, the um, uh, what happens when you vary the interest rate and the term of the loan, uh, the blue being each year uh, on this. So if you start off with a loan that's for 15 years at 7% and you reduce the interest rate by uh, 1%, so it's uh, becomes a, uh, you, you end up at, with a 6% loan, but you actually also save 6% in terms of the cost. If you're also able to um, make it a 20-year loan, going out five more years uh, really does uh, save you 14%. Um, so if you, and if you were able to do both, you would actually be, uh, the annualized cost would be um, less, would be, I'm sorry, would be greater than 20% savings. And as you see, as you go um, out more years and you uh, decrease the loan rate, the cost obviously goes down pretty dramatically. Um, so that last bar over here uh, represents 40 years. You may not have seen loans of that length, but in fact, um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture loan program, the Community Facilities Program I was referring to before, they do make direct loans of up to 40 years. Uh, and they also provide interest rate subsidies as well. So depending on the income in the area it qualifies, um, you can both get a, uh, a very long repayment term and a reduced interest rate that is, would produce a significant savings. So loan sources, obviously conventional bank loans, 
bonds, general obligation bonds, or, or the governmentally issued bonds. So school district bonds, for example, are general obligation bonds. They're supported by the um, uh, tax base. But there also are uh, nonprofit bonds, which are so-called uh, 501c3 revenue bonds. There's also taxable revenue bonds. But any nonprofit organization um, is eligible for uh, tax-exempt bond financing, which means you basically get a lower interest rate because the people who are buying the bonds uh, aren't being taxed uh, on their uh, earnings, interest earnings, so you get a lower rate. So that's one way that you can um, using a, a revenue bond as a way to, to reduce the cost. I mentioned U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA, um, a number of state development finance agencies. I mentioned in Maryland there's a program for a child care facilities specifically, but a lot of other states um, may not have a specific program for child care facilities, but do do business financing and have various financing programs available, and that should always be explored. And then there's community development finance institutions. These are often nonprofit organizations, and they are generally focused on community development. They lend to generally low-income communities. They also do a lot of child care lending. Their underwriting is, is often um, more lenient uh, than conventional uh, bank underwriting. So then I wanted to show you one particularly ambitious example in, in Connecticut. Connecticut has a debt service support model uh, where the state really provides a very deep capital subsidy for profit providers in very low income communities. So the provider has to provide at least 10% of the cost of the project in equity. And this can be in the form of land. Uh, they can raise it from um, uh, the local municipality using community development block grant money. They can do a capital campaign, but they need to come up with around 10, at least 10 percent. Uh, on average, it's been about 12 percent. And then the debt portion of the um, project, the rest of it, is financed with a revenue bond, a nonprofit revenue bond, with the state agreeing to pay at least 80 percent of the debt service uh, and the provider um, providing the rest. So if you look at the overall cost of the project, it's basically 12 percent is, on average, uh, provider equity. 18 percent, on average, is the, what the provider pays annually, uh, its, its share of the debt, uh, and what it will pay over the life of the 30-year mortgage, what they will, uh, their contribution to the cost of the project. And then the state uh, pays 70 percent. And with this program, in just 10 years, they've built 29 facilities uh, uh, leveraged about $100 million, $94 million, and has provided space for 5,100 children. So um, it's a very dramatic example of how you um, use a favorable financing tool, revenue bonds, that get low interest rates. It's backed up by the state, so that they get an especially low interest rate. They spread it out over 30 years, and uh, they, they find a, the, the, the sweet spot where a provider can afford to service debt, and the state picks up the rest of that. Okay, let's move on to equity. So, I mean, this is uh, this graph sort of says the obvious. Obviously, uh, if you uh, if you just take those two bars on the left and the right, the the left one represents a uh, mortgage principal of two hundred thousand dollars and a uh, equity of fifty thousand. So the project pays two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That blue portion represents the, the down payment. If you look at the bar on the right-hand side, you have a project that is 425000 same amount of um, debt, but it's um, doing that because you have a lot more equity. So getting, uh, raising equity is obviously a, a tool that uh, makes projects much more feasible. So what are the sources of equity? So this is where the creative financing comes in. And uh, it looks like doing an early childhood facility is, uh, on its face, not really feasible. Um, it's hard work. It takes creativity. And it takes layered financing. And that's what we're beginning to talk about here, this idea of layered financing. So you need to find financing from a variety of different sources. So state, federal, and foundation grants is, is one example. Um, and uh, I'll talk about those a little bit more in one second. Uh, net worth, that is to say if uh, you're a child care provider, uh, an organization provides child care, or uh, even a public school system that has retained earnings on its balance sheet, that's obviously a source of equity. 
Uh, you can um, do capital campaigns. Nonprofits do that all the time to raise money for a major capital project. Special appropriations from uh, uh, state legislatures uh, is another thing I have seen uh, happen on a number of occasions. Tax credits are a very um, common way of financing other kinds of um, facilities. And there's two kinds that I have seen used in early childhood facilities. One is uh, something called New Markets Tax Credits, and the other is Historic Preservation Tax Credits. These are both federal programs, and they are legally complicated. You actually have to create a uh, affiliated entity, a partnership, uh, and corporations mostly will try to get uh, invest in these in order to get some tax shelter. So new markets tax credits um, uh, are available in uh, more economically distressed areas. It's an economic development tool. Historic preservation tax credits, if it's an old building and it is a historic building, there are usually additional costs in renovating those kinds of buildings in order to retain the historic qualities of it, and therefore you're eligible for these tax credits. And then there's things that are, are kind of quasi-equity. Uh, we talked before about subordinated loans. That, in a way, is a little bit like equity uh, in some cases. And there's programs, um, not in child care, but in affordable housing, particularly um, supported housing, where they, um, the public sector provides second mortgage deferred loans. So there's no current payment on the loan. So essentially, it is like, um, like equity. And, um, and then third-party loan repayment, as in Connecticut, where the state is actually uh, repaying the loan. So I recently worked on a, a, a large project here in Boston where a, a large child care provider uh, has been in the basement of a public housing facility for, it's hard to believe it, but 50 years. And it's an abysmal uh, facility, but a very good child care program. And they are building a new center. Uh, they have uh, financed it. They've gotten a $5 million federal grant from the Department of Housing and Urban Development that was available for public housing authorities. Uh, so the public housing authority on behalf of this nonprofit applied for this money and uh, they got five million dollars. They are using the um, new markets tax credits that you know, we talked about a minute ago. That raising two million dollars from that source, that'll be equity. They are borrowing two million dollars from a bank and they are doing a capital campaign. As I said, this is a big project. Uh, and um, expect to raise uh, in excess of $3 million from that. And uh, their hope is actually to be able to raise enough to retire that $2 million uh, conventional bank uh, mortgage as well. So it's taking money from a variety of different sources, and it's being very creative. You know, so they, the facility happens to be uh, being built on, on uh, a public housing site. Uh, it also means that they are uh, getting the space uh, on a lease, so they're not paying for the land itself, they're just build, uh, paying for the building. Uh, they have a $1 a year lease agreement with the Public Housing Authority, and it's uh, a 100-year uh, lease, so that the building is secure there for a long period of time. And um, that's the secret, I think, to these kinds of projects, is um, creativity, taking advantage of um, the kinds of organizations that are involved in a project. Head Start, for example, there are grants that are available from Head Start. Um, they're more scarce at the moment, but you know each participant can find sources, whether they are uh, from HUD housing, uh, from rural development, from economic development at the state level or the federal level, uh, and uh, creatively putting those together. But um, for uh, people um, um, get off. I, I just wanted to give people a chance to, if there's any questions, to um, type them in, and uh, I, I'll go on for a few minutes longer. But if you have uh, some questions and you'd like me to, to answer those now, I'm uh, be happy to do that. While you're composing your questions, I'll uh, just give you a quick um, look at some buildings. Um, here's classrooms that, uh, again, have a kind of more residential feel. The one in the lower right um, is uh, interesting simply because it's an irregular classroom and that actually creates a lot of uh, special places within it um, to break it up. So you have here in this area here you'll notice there's a soffit, a lower ceiling, 
There's also is a platform underneath it, so it's separated out. Uh, there's uh, the central area here, which is more like a living room. It has a very home-like environment. Uh, I'm a, a real fan of lofts because you create one underneath the loft, and it has a very intimate feeling. And uh, above, you have an area that, again, is, creates a, a dual use of the same square footage. And for the children, it provides a very different kind of environment. It's often a nice place to retreat to while you can sort of watch what's going on in, in the classroom. And this is another example of, this is a common space I mentioned at the beginning with that bubble diagram. Uh, this is a center that has worked hard to create a, a residential environment. So when you walk in the door, this is the uh, front door here, when you walk in, you're looking in that at the other picture, which uh, looks like it is a, a small kitchenette and um, dining room-like table. And if you look at the corridor uh, there on the right, uh, they've made it, uh, just put a little curve in the corridor, which takes the kind of institutional sting out of a, a corridor. Uh, it's not as hard as a straight corridor. And even the things like the doors, you see they're uh, divided light, small panes of glass that kind of lead more residential than institutional. And, uh, uh, you know, it's more of a living room setting. So it's uh, very welcoming to families and, and really the space that uh, doesn't feel institutional. One of the major movements in, in early childhood facilities is the move to natural playgrounds, which you can see in the upper left-hand corner there. Uh, you don't see any swings. You won't see uh, a, a lot of equipment. But there's things like uh, logs for children to uh, well, use to balance on. Uh, the uh, sandbox is more of a, a pit. There's a big garden area. There's uh, trike paths. There's differences in, in the elevation in the space. So kids will you know, roll down hills and things like that. It's, it becomes much more active play and more variety of play uh, than you'll find in many uh, very expensive playgrounds that uh, you see. And then it's also important in the lower right is that you have a procreated adult space. And uh, as an example of that in the center. So I wanted to include a couple of resources um, that uh, you might want to look at in terms of development and finance, the kind of things uh, I was talking about today. Um, there is a guide that uh, is free online that you can get. And I, with the uh, information uh, there. There's also a report that a lot of this presentation was based on that was put out by the National Institute for Early Education Research at Rutgers. Um, and um, I put the uh, web address where you can get that PDF file. Uh, in terms of um, design, um, two design resources, another resource guide um, that's for free on the right there. And there's the web address. There's also uh, a book that's uh, pretty standard um, uh, in this field, Child Care Design Guide. People um, rely on it uh, often, and uh, it's very good information. Uh, in terms of anthropometrics, that is scaling things to the size that children are, and uh, just the ergonomics of uh, young children, these are two resources. Um, I know the left one is out of print, but sometimes uh, you can find it in libraries and elsewhere. Uh, and that those are, are certainly helpful. They're, they're hard to find that kind of information in a lot of places. And finally, on playgrounds and greening spaces, um, I know there are two good resources there that, that you can look at. So if um, there are any more questions, uh, I'm certainly uh, more than happy to answer them. So grant programs. Uh, someone has asked, do you know of any Grant programs, federal, state, which support early childhood facilities development. Um, as I said, you, you sort of, they're, they're very limited. The state of Pennsylvania had one for a number of years, um, uh, what they called the Challenge Grant, where they, uh, the first year provided up to a million dollars per project. Uh, and the second year it was half a million. The second and third year it was half a million. The provider had to raise 25% of the cost. So there, there are programs state by state that um, come along and then go. I mentioned the, the HUD grant program that was uh, used here in Boston. And uh, that was specifically for early childhood facilities and public housing authority sites. Uh, and uh, so uh, I assume, I think there were seven uh, projects funded nationally. And that was a, a one-time program. 
So there's opportunities like that that you just have to look for and shop around. So when you start doing a project like this, uh, it's not like there's uh, it's easy pickings. It's um, it's hard work finding other revenue sources of revenue that you wouldn't expect, such as the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, and again, they do have a grant program. That community facilities program is, uh, has a grant program. If, uh, again, the community is fewer than 20,000 people. Uh, the grants are, are primarily available if the income is lower. They also have a loan guarantee program I mentioned. They have a direct program with an interest rate subsidy. So there's, um, depending where the, 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 the project is located, and depending on the character of the community and who the partners are, there there are sometimes uh, good sources. Um, do you know of any? Uh, let's see. Uh, the public early childhood always had to be tied to a district. What do you say? It's the first step for individuals to consider opening their own separate from the school. So I, I think this is an area of, of real promise: partnerships between um, early childhood providers and school systems. Um, for a, a number of reasons. There, there is a, an organization in, in Georgia called the Early Learning Property Management, and it started out in, in Atlanta. It was initiated by some funders, um, and they uh, had a great deal of money that they raised from the Whitehead Foundation, which is the Coca-Cola company uh, family money. Um, and they set about to um, renovate and build uh, Head Start centers. That is, they, they were concerned about the quality of the facilities that they were seeing. And so they uh, were making grants, and they also became a developer of these facilities so that for um, providers who had fewer resources, they actually built the facility for them and then leased it to them at a, a, a $5 a square foot, which is a, a very minimal uh, cost, and they uh, managed the property otherwise. They have now done some work with public school systems, too, where uh, they have taken uh, vacant school buildings, completely re renovated them. Nonprofit um, programs have moved into the space, and it, it includes the town's uh, public preschool program is run by a private nonprofit that's in that space. So there's these partnerships that are beginning to develop uh, where you're combining public space with uh, private providers uh, and vice versa. And there's a lot of room, I think, for creativity there. Um, and uh, uh, you, you need to find, uh, look for, for creative partners, and you need to be creative yourself. I think there's any more questions I missed here. That looks like all the questions. I appreciate your interest in this topic, and um, I hope this has been a, a helpful session for you. Thanks for the opportunity. ASEF would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Mr. Carl Sussman, and our participants for joining our web bar today. Remember to visit our website at www.acefacilities.org and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please take a moment to complete the webinar evaluation. We value your opinion and look forward to hearing your feedback.
kind of sound absorbing materials you have, uh, natural and artificial um, light. Uh, I was recently involved in a um, study of facilities in, in Massachusetts, a big survey of early childhood facilities, and we found that there were 15% of the classrooms had no natural light, which uh, I found just remarkable to think about children spending entire day, every day, uh, in a space without natural light. And then it's very common to find uh, lighting schemes in classrooms, as you do in public school classrooms, which are this um, laid-in fluorescent lights in an acoustic ceiling, um, which provides good lighting, but and very uniform lighting and one type of lighting, whereas in an early childhood environment, if you try to create smaller spaces within that large space, you really want to try to use different kinds of lighting some that's uh, not as diffuse as um, the fluorescent lights uh, provide. And we talked about plumbing and bathrooms. And then classroom configuration, again, is um, uh, it's often easier to create these uh, well-defined smaller areas uh, if you have um, uh, a classroom that's not just a rectangle. That it has a little bit more complexity to it, alcoves, things like that, that allow you to you also have a, a platform bringing the, the floor up higher. So that creates a very different and more intimate um, space, and it's very well defined uh, by these, uh, the furniture and the walls. So you actually have three corners, um, which are very protected areas, and if you just have one big open space, even if you just have um, creating activity space, you don't create quite as sheltered and, and enclosed a sense as you uh, do when you do it architecturally as it has been done in this case. So this is a case where you take a classroom, which is a big space for a young child, and you create smaller spaces within it. It's almost like you think of it as a house with rooms. In this case, it's a classroom with activity spaces, but they have to be kind of well-defined and, and distinct. Um, so scaling the building, the classrooms, and then the different features in the classroom, like to think height to the, to the uh, children's level. In terms of ambiance, almost everything I've ever read about early childhood facilities um, talks about trying to create a more of a residential ambiance as opposed to an institutional one. Um, and so the treatment of halls, lighting, things like that can have a big effect on um, how the space feels. And then uh, the sensory environment. I talked before about the importance of language acquisition. And so acoustics in these early childhood classrooms is very important. Uh, and what kind of sound absorbing materials you have, uh, natural and artificial um, light, 